my comments. Um, I was asked to speak about Paul Robeson um, and Paul Robeson's opinion of Stalin and his opinion of the Soviet Union, which are two things which are very much intertwined. I first learnt about Paul Robeson on the 100th anniversary of his birth, which was now 15 years ago in 1998. Um, I hadn't known about him at all before then, because he's a figure who's very much really written out of history. You don't hear his songs played widely, even though they occupy quite a historic and pivotal role in the development of film industry and, uh, and recording industry. He has some beautiful songs. He was the first person who notably started recording Negro, Negro spirituals and popularizing them, and at the time was a, was a vastly popular, popular performer. Um, there are many things about him and his life, which actually parallels Stalin's in quite a remarkable way, if you look at them. Paul Robeson was born in Princeton. <coughs> Stalin wasn't born in Princeton, obviously. Uh, Paul Robeson was born in Princeton. His, his father had been a slave in North Carolina. Uh, his father had been, obviously, a, a proud man who was born to slavery, who never accepted the dogma that, that would have been prevalent and hard to overlook that blacks were in some way inferior growing up in that system, and he escaped on the Underground Railroad North, um, and he came to live in Princeton. It must be the case that he would have come into contact with people such as Harriet Tubman, who famously conducted the, the Underground Railroad, and who famously said, I will have one of, one of two things, I will have my liberty or my death, and, you know, let no man put their hand upon me, I won't sacrifice my freedom. And still those, I think, are very inspiring words and sentiments of the oppressed everywhere when they're struggling for their freedom. Um, I'm sure that he would have played, I recently wrote an article on the American Civil War, I'm sure he must have played some role, his father in the American Civil War. Um, interesting to note, again, not widely known, that 25% of the Union Navy, which was integrated, were blacks, and some 10% of the Union Army were black, and they played a really decisive role in the victory of the Americans. <coughs> so Afro-Americans, despite being initially a, an enslaved people, a, a, a people of an internal colony, if you like, in the United States, especially in the, in the South United States, played a pivotal role in the development of the modern nation and won their place, won their freedom, um, despite suffering many reverses after the restoration well, uh, of, of their socially inferior position. The, the, there was the abolition of slavery. It's not widely known and appreciated that, that Stalin himself, his father, had been a serf. So essentially, he also came from the stock of the people who were just recently liberated from a semi-slavery position, not free to move from the land, inferior in social status, and from an inferior nation within a large empire of Tsarism. Um, so that there, was, there was that parallel. Stalin, of course, joining the revolutionary movement and really, you know, from a young age, he was, he was a talented guy um, whose mother saw the chance to educate him and make something of his life and wanted him to go into the seminary. So he went into the, uh, the seminary at Tiffley, got an education, came into contact with Mar Marxist literature and never really looked back, was thrown out of the seminary, gained a, 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 a really excellent knowledge through his own personal hard study of Marxism threw himself into the revolutionary movement and ultimately we know came to play a pivotal role in the successful victory of, of that revolutionary movement um, coming to lead the mother nation and all of the lesser nations and in, in coming from an inferior nation, a so called from a colonised nation, he understood the pivotal importance of correcting the relations between so called superior and inferior nationalities, the colonised and the colonisers in order to create a, foster a great unity and create a great force of the working and oppressed masses that was capable of working towards liberation. And that's something that had a very deep resonance with Robeson when he saw it. Robeson grew in a place where Jim Crow and segregation was the norm, where blacks still in, occupied in fear of race despite their history in the Civil War. Um, he was a very intelligent kid. Um, who did well at school, got a scholarship to go to university, went to Tuskegee University while he was there. He was a 
hulk of a man who was talented in, in many respects and he went to play American football there. The team, who were all the rest of them were white, there were hardly any black people at university, set upon him, basically tortured him, broke his collarbone, pulled his you know, nails out of his hand uh, to let him know that you know, black people weren't welcome in the football team. And his father raised him to say that, you know, we're equal in every way and we have to take everything we get. We have to overcome those odds and we have to show that we're capable of struggle and changing the world. He was a passionate believer that the heights of knowledge had to be scaled by the freedom seeker. So there was no area of knowledge that could be barred to them, but equally had to show a gritty and steely determination to assert their right to that knowledge and a right to their place in the sun and a right to abolish that system of discrimination. So he, over, he overcame that. He went on to become an all-American football player, something which in itself is, you know, an acad a, sorry, a, a sporting accolade. He was the valedictorian of his of his class, meaning he read the kind of speech saying farewell to the class, which is a big thing in the states. This remains a big thing for them. Um, and then he went on to study law, but found that well, there was segregation. He couldn't really pursue a career in the law, so he turned to his other interests in arts. Became a fantastic singer. Legitimi legitimized, if you like, the heritage of, of, of the slaves, which was their, their music, if you like, their, their spirit of resistance, the Negro spiritual, made it a, a, a kind of a, a, an accepted part of the American cultural scene, became famous in acting and on the stage. But at that time, he found the atmosphere more liberal in Europe, and he actually left the United States to come to Europe. And it was during his time in Europe that he really came into contact with the working class movement and he found that despite the fact that he was black and relatively privileged, that the, at that time, in the, in the late 20s and early 30s, he had a tremendous sympathy with, with the rising working class movement. This was a time when there would have been the old CPGB that everyone among us can agree was a revolutionary party. And he came into contact with white working class people and felt he had a tremendous uh, commonality of interests with them uh, in fighting oppression. And when he went to Wales in particular and heard their singing and they heard his singing, they took him into their hearts, really, um, and explained to him that although he was privileged, he was from a basically an oppressed people, as they were oppressed working people. And as far as they were concerned, you know, they were the same people. Uh, he had a very moving relationship with them. And it was under their influence that he first went to the... Well, he first he went to Spain, actually, and he sung in Spain in the international brigades. Um, he didn't go there until 1938, so right before the fall of the Republic. But he sang there, you know, in many tongues, and there are many songs, and was very close to the people of Spain, Republican Spain. And he never really looked back from his association um, with the Soviet Union and their ideas. And I'm going to read a little... So this is what Robeson said in his own words, and here I stand. He said, there I saw that it was the working men and women of Spain who were heroically giving their last full measure of devotion to the cause of democracy in that bloody conflict, and that it was the upper class, the landed gentry, the bankers and industrialists, who had unleashed the fascist beast against their own people. From the ranks of the workers of other lands, volunteers had come to help in the epic defense of Madrid. And in Spain, I sang with my whole heart and soul for these gallant fighters of the International Brigade. A new warm feeling for my homeland grew within me as I met the men of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion, the thousands of brave young Americans who had crossed the sea to fight and die as another government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. My heart was filled with admiration and love for these white Americans, and there was a sense of great pride in my own people, <clears throat> when I saw that there were Negroes too in the ranks of the Lincoln men in Spain. Some of them, like Oliver Laws and Milton Herndon, were to be among <clears throat> excuse me, the heavy casualties suffered by the volunteers and would be buried along with their white comrades in the Spanish earth, a long way from home. From home, yes, from America, my own home. And I knew in my own heart that I'd surely return there someday. I think it's so important at this time I was speaking to a friend of mine about our party, the CPGBML, and the Stalin Society to an extent. And he was saying, yeah, no, it's fine, but it's like a Soviet 
history society and I wonder if it really has any ongoing relevance to today and you know what's your strategy for really affecting a change in this country and I think it's something we have to always consider in all our activities and my fundamental answer is that yeah, society is organised in, uh, in a very poor manner to satisfy the interests of the vast majority of human beings and I don't think en at any time on the face of the earth a greater civilization or more steps to correct that situation have been taken under the leadership of the old Soviet leaders and that they really blazed the trail which remains absolutely pertinent and relevant to us today and so then the question always to me is how, how do we build that movement here? I think we have the material in England to build such a movement. I think it's in the interests of the vast majority of people to build such a movement. And so the question is, how do you take the transition from being, if you like, a despised and reviled and victimised member of a working class, essentially oppressed, even an imperialist nation, and cross over to the point where you have the confidence to assert your right to change society, that you have a pattern that you see, think it's feasible, and you start to gather people together to do it. And a very important part of that is to break the media monopoly that constantly tells them that it's not possible. If it's in the interest and in a perfectly sane and rational thing for imperialism every day to declare that Stalin was a monster and you know and so Soviet Union you know is dead and Marxism is dead and there's no way forward for working people, it's absolutely our duty to reassert that actually it is possible. We have a glorious and rich culture and heritage. And it's precisely by ploughing this furrow that we can actually begin to make that change. And it's very instructive to see how people coming from the belly of the beast, from imperialist countries, can and were inspired by the example of the Soviet Union. I'm going to finish in a little while by reading Star uh, uh, Robeson's own assessment of Stalin <coughs> and the role that he made. But I think Robeson's life itself, coming from an oppressed people, throughout his twists and turns in his career of seeing the living, breathing example of the Soviet Union, what it meant in real practical terms, especially to colonised and oppressed people, um, and his approach of one of real internationalism, of never falling for what is again becoming popular, of a kind of a, a black separatist or a national separatist or a minority position. He, he absolutely overwhelmingly saw from the example of the Soviet Union it's possible to solve national differences, <coughs> racial differences, religious differences, the contradiction between men and women, the contradiction between old and young, between town and country, <laughs> and actually build a tremendous unity and, and a force for change. And really, that is the message I think we need to take from the Soviet Union, from Stalin, and bring it you know, into a modern context in, in our work and our daily bearing. Um, during the war, Robeson had, during the Second World War, Robeson had a relatively easy time. Obviously, we know there were lots of uncharacteristic features um, of American imperialism that came out during that time. Because of their temporary alliance with the Soviet Union, they had a temporary truce from their propaganda and even made, you know, programs and published books showing how great the Soviet people were, how great Stalin's leadership was, that he was tight on the cover of Time magazine as their man of the year for two years and all the rest of it. So he had a relatively easy time during the war, but after the war, the propaganda against Robeson was well and truly stepped up and he found himself um, increasingly pushed to the side. He actually visited the Soviet Union again in 1949 uh, and, he, and while he was there, he commented um, well, no, actually, on the way back, he went to the Paris Peace Conference. And there he was encouraged by reporters to denounce the Soviet Union. Um, he said, I think the specific question was, if there was going to be a war, because the Cold War kind of atmosphere was really setting in hard then, if there was going to be a Soviet war, if there was going to be a war, a, a war between America and the Soviet Union, you know, wh whose side would you encourage you know, black Americans to fight on? And he basically said, it is unthinkable that American Negroes could go to war on behalf of those who have oppressed them for generations against the Soviet Union, which in one generation has raised our people to full human dignity. I think it's important to note that while he was in Britain during the 20s and 30s, he actually studied at SOAS and started to uncover there a real untold story of the towering civilization of Africa, which to him stood alongside the, the, the civilization of Europe uh, and the civilization of Asia. 
And actually, at that time, he, he tells a, a funny story. He says, you know, as he was starting to propagate this information, really a kind of self-improvement, a kind of early black power, not black power, but to say, look, there's no way that you can be held down as subhuman, as, as a lesser people. You have a rich culture and heritage which has simply been written out of history because it's expedient for colonialism to do so. And he said at that time he was actually he was he was propagating that information. He said it was important he felt for the blacks themselves within America, England, and elsewhere to know it, because at that time he came into contact with a lot of people who were studying from Africa and the colonies in England, who were building a national liberation movement. And he said the British intelligence came one day to caution me about the political meaning of my activities, for the question loomed large of itself: if African culture was that what I said it was, what happens to the British imperialist claim that it would take? a thousand years for Africans to be capable of self-rule. So their real material interests were threatened by this seemingly abstract and you know, esoteric uh, academic pursuit. And it was at that time that he was told he should go to the Soviet Union, because one of his friends had told him uh, about Africa, uh, about uh, something he had observed in the Soviet Union. He said on a visit to that country, he'd travelled east and he'd seen the Yakuts, a people who had been classed as a backward race by the Tsars, and he'd been struck by the resemblance between the tribal life of the Yakuts and his own people of East Africa. What would happen to their y Yakuts now that they had been freed from colonial oppression and were part of the construction of a socialist society? Well, I went to see for myself, and on my first visit to the Soviet Union in 1934... I saw how the Yakuts and Uzbeks and all the other formerly oppressed nations were leaping ahead from tribalism to modern industrial economy, from illiteracy towards the heights of knowledge, the ancient cultures blooming in new and greater richness, the young men and women mastering the sciences and arts. A thousand years, no, less than twenty. <clears throat> But after the war, as I say, the climate was radically changed. And particularly after his intervention, after the Paris Peace Conference, he found that he was barred from appearing in movies, uh, barred from the stage. He'd been a very great uh, Shakespearean actress, amongst other things, and famously was one of the first black men who played Othello to a white audience <coughs> in the South. Theatre growing audience was overwhelmingly uh, white in America. Um, so it had many, many artistic and academic acc accolades and strings to his bow. But he went on, nevertheless, to be unbowed. Um, the NAACP, who were the leadership in you know, the National Association of Afro-American and Coloured Peoples, um, were of a much more bourgeois leaning and simply wanted to, if you like, get rid of some of the discrimination towards the black bourgeoisie within America, allow them to develop, but not get rid of the edifice of exploitation, not really have a revolutionary leaning on the struggle, but nevertheless had a, had a, had a role to play, obviously, as we're familiar historically, um, in the civil rights movement, what's referred to as the civil rights movement. Although Robeson really was one of the forefathers of the, of the civil rights movement, together with people like W.B. Du Bois. But then the NAACP disowned him. They found this all a bit distasteful. They thought this was bringing you know, all this anti-communist rhetoric to, to bear on black people within America. Um, people would see them as a disloyal part of society. And, and they, would, they were disowned. And Robeson pointed out that you know, they didn't have that calm in 1944 when they gave him the Spingarn Medal in services of freedom to all men. Um, and he went on to assert the tremendous strides, uh, in fact he said in his acceptance speech at the time, that the tremendous strides of the various peoples of the Soviet Union uh, have given the greatest proof of the latent abilities not only of so-called agricultural peoples, presumably unfitted for intricate industrial technique, but also of so-called backward peoples who have clearly demonstrated that they function like all others. He went on to say that even in the worst period of McCarthyism, he saw no reason why my convictions should change with the weather. I was not raised that way, and neither the promise of gain nor the threat of loss has ever moved me from my firm convictions. <clears throat> I think it's worth just very briefly saying that he was called to um, testify 
before the House Committee on on American Affairs in '56, and one of his last of interventions, public interventions in American life. And it was, I mean, people were being called up from all walks of life and and asked to disavow, asked whether they were members of the Communist Party, asked to publicly disavow, you know being associated with the Communist movement and the Communist Party. It's not clear to this day, really, whether Robeson was a member or wasn't a member of the Communist Party. I don't think it's really the point. It's clear he was a, it was clear he was a great believer and sympathiser in scientific socialism, great friend of the Soviet Union, Soviet people, and saw the way towards liberation of all people down that line and wanted to do everything in his power to encourage and promote the movement. Um, but when he was called up, to testify uh, in 57. Um, He angered the senators by telling them, in Russia, I felt for the first time like a full human being. No colour prejudice like in Mississippi. No colour prejudice like in Washington. The senators angrily demanded, why didn't you stay in Russia then if you love it so much? And he retorted quick as a flash, because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country and I'm going to stay right here and have a piece of it just like you. (laughs) And no fascist-minded people will drive me from it. Is that clear? (laughs) He was made of steely stuff. said history shows that the process of social change has nothing in common with silly notions of plots and conspiracies the development of human society from tribalism to feudalism to capitalism to socialism is brought about by the needs and aspirations of mankind for a better life and it's clear from all that he said and did in his life that he was a true Marxist a true friend of the Soviet Union a champion of real internationalism, a champion of integrationist approach to building unity amongst the working class and for all those things I salute him for all those things he saluted the Soviet Union and Stalin and I think it's maybe fitting just to end, as much more I could say but to end with, with his <coughs> his tribute to Stalin which is only, it's brief really, it's a, it's a couple of A4 pages, I hope you'll bear with me, I'm just going to basically read it to you, there's no, there's no way I can augment or embellish it, it's very beautiful, I think once you're familiar with Robeson there's no question as to its authenticity. I only bring that up because there are people who doubt it. I mean, a month, it was 15 years ago, I think I made a presentation which was exclusively on, on Robeson at that time to the Stalin Society. It was on my birthday, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and after I'd learned about him, because it, you know, it was, a, it was a, a topic that was coming up 100 years after his birth in, in lots of spheres, the SWP held it, the, the, as they do, their... Marxism, 1998, it was then. And they had a big session on Robeson, and they brought people up to to talk about Robeson's contribution. And they talked about some of these, you know, major cultural achievements of his. They gave a brief <coughs> portrait of his life. But what they really wanted to get to the bottom of was how that Robeson, when he went back to the Soviet Union for the second time, spent most of his time disgusted at the national oppression of the Jews and was singing songs of protest about them. And, I mean, it's their own line, which they're attributing to Robeson, and there's no objective evidence to say that. But I wrote at the end of an article I wrote at the time, and I, and I, think, I think it kind of answers the point as, as well as any. What, what would that say? You know, would such slanders, like they, they were trying to un- undermine ropes of support of the Soviet Union, dissociate what was obviously a great and popular figure from the Soviet Union, which they've made it their business, if you like, their stock in trade to slander. But where does that leave Robeson? Because if their allegations are true, and he didn't raise his voice in open protest, having allegedly witnessed some kind of national oppression of, of, of the Jews, what's left of Robeson's integrity? Why did he suffer such privation when denouncing the Soviet Union, would have had a stroke, you know, restored his career to its former glory, if it was not, as he consistently maintained, in fact free from all national, racial and religious prejudice, to the point that, having said that it was the first place where he walked fully upright as a human being, he sent his own son 
to be educated there. We tell stories of, yeah, there was a little bit, of, it was asked, wasn't there racism in Russia? Well, they said a very small amount of residual racism. One boy once called him a racist name in class. The other members of the class rounded on that boy and made him so thoroughly ashamed of himself and ostracised that Paul Robeson's son, Paul Jr., ended up feeling sorry for the guy who had <laughs> taunted him with racist abuse. That was the spirit at that time when he went there. Now we can see that with the destruction of the Soviet Union, with the reintroduction of national strife, with the reintroduction of capitalism, how there's a resurgent fascist movement, how even, sadly, because the communists were the ones who actually made the Soviet Union great, and Stalin was such a great leader, there's even a faction of the fascist movement which looks up to Stalin as the great national leader and founder. <laughs> so there's all kinds of resurgence of right-wing propaganda there, and no doubt racism there now. We know that there is. We have to look at football matches in Ukraine to see that that is the case. But that was certainly not the atmosphere of the time when people were moving forward and building. And what Paul Robeson saw and witnessed then remains one of the greatest testimonies to the way in which a prison of nations can be turned into a brotherhood of nations. And without that experience, without that movement, without that goal, there's no way forward for us in really reshaping and remodeling human history. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to what Robeson said. I say, really, having studied a man and seen him, you can see from the words that they're Robeson's own words. They're unforced, unstinted, and they give a generous and full appraisal of Stalin's worth, which I think is timely to remind ourselves now after 60 years of, of Stalin's death. And so I'll, I'll let Robeson say the rest. It's called To You, Beloved Comrade, by Paul Robeson. He says, there is no richer store of human experience uh, than the folk tales, folk poems and songs of a people. In many, the heroes are always fully recognisable humans, only larger and more embracing in dimension. And so it is with the Russian, Chinese and African folklore. In 1937, a highly expectant audience of Moscow citizens, workers, artists, youth, farmers from surrounding <laughs> towns, crowded the Bolshoi Theatre. They awaited a performance by the Uzbek National Theatre, headed by the highly gifted Tamara Khanu. The orchestra was a large one, with instruments ancient and modern. How exciting would be the blending of the music of the rich culture of Mussorgsky, Tchaikovsky, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, Krenikov, Glier, with that of the beautiful music of the Esbeks, stemming from an old and proud civilization. Suddenly, everyone stood, began to applaud, to cheer and to smile. The children waved. In a box to the right, smiling and applauding at the audience, as well as the artists on stage, stood the great Stalin. <clears throat> I remember the tears began to quietly flow, and I too smiled and waved. Here was clearly a man who seemed to embrace all. So kindly, I can never forget the warm feeling of kindliness and also a feeling of sureness. Here was one who was wise and good, the world, and especially the social, socialist world, uh, was fortunate indeed to have his daily guidance. I lifted high my son, Paulie, to wave to this world leader and his leader, for Paulie Jr. had entered school in Moscow in the land of the Soviets. The wonderful performance began, unfolding new delights at every turn, ensemble and individual, vocal and orchestral, classic and folk dancing of amazing originality. Could it be possible that a few years before, in 1900, in 1915, these people had been semi-serfs? <coughs> their cultural expression forbidden, their rich heritage almost lost under Zionist oppression's heel. So here one witnessed in the field of the arts a culture national in form, socialist in content. Here was a people quite comparable to some of the tribal folk of Asia, quite comparable to the proud Yoruba, or Basutu, of West and East Africa. But now their lives flowering anew within the socialist way of life, 20 years matured under the guidance of Lenin and Stalin. And in this whole area of development of national minorities, of their relation to the great Russians, Stalin had played and was playing a most decisive role. I was later to travel to see with my own eyes what could happen to the so-called backward peoples in the West, in England, in Belgium, France, Portugal, Holland, the Africans, the Indians, East and West. Many of the Asian peoples were considered so backward that centuries, perhaps, 
would have to pass before these so-called colonials could become a part of modern society. But in the Soviet Union, Yakuts, Genetsis, Kyrgyz, Tajiks had respect and were helped to advance with unbelievable rapidity in this socialist land. No empty promises such as coloured folk continuously here in the United <coughs> States, but deeds. For example, the transforming of the desert in Uzbekistan into blooming acres of cotton. And an old friend of mine, Mr. Golden, trained under Carver at Tuskegee, played a prominent role in cotton production. In 1949, I saw his daughter, now grown in the university, a proud Soviet citizen. Today, in Korea, today, of course, he's speaking on the death of Stalin in 56. Sorry, 53. Today in Korea, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America and the West Indies, in the Middle East, in Africa, one sees tens of millions of long-oppressed colonial peoples surging towards freedom. What a difference in the national and international atmosphere there is between then and now. When Stalin was at the head of the communist movement, imperialism was on the back foot. And now our movement is at its absolute nadir and imperialism seems rampant but they're stirring up the contradictions which are again allowing us a way forward what courage, what sacrifice what determination never to rest until victory and arrayed against them the combined powers of so called free west headed by the greedy, profit hungry war minded industrialists and financial barons of our America the illusion of an American century blinds them for the immediate present to the clear fact that civilization has passed them by, that we now live in a people's century, that the star shines brightly in the east of Europe and of the world. Colonial peoples today look to the Soviet socialist republics. And really, a sober assessment of the last century, as was made by our comrades on the century past, really does show that it was the century of communism and really does herald the way forward even now. They see how, under the great Stalin, millions like themselves have found a new life. They see that, aided and guided by the example of the Soviet Union, led by their Mao Zedong, a new China adds its mighty power to the true and expanding socialist way of life. They see formerly semi-colonial Eastern European nations building new people's democracies based upon the people's power, with the people shaping their own destinies. So much of this progress stems from the magnificent leadership, theoretical and practical, given by their friend, Joseph Stalin. They have sung, sing now, and will sing his praise in song and story. Slava, 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 Stalin. Glory to Stalin. Forever will his name be honoured and beloved in all lands. In all spheres of modern life, the influence of Stalin reaches wide and deep. From his last simply written but vastly discerning and comprehensive document, which is the economic problems of socialism that we heard something about earlier. Uh, back through the years, his contributions to the science of our world society remain invaluable. One reverently speaks of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Stalin, the shapers of humanity's richest present and future. Yes, through his deep humanity, by his wise understanding, he leaves us a rich and monumental heritage. Most importantly, he has charted the direction of our present and future struggles. He has pointed the way to peace, to friendly coexistence, to the exchange of mutual scientific and cultural contributions, to the end of war and destruction. How consistently, how patiently he laboured for peace and ever-increasing abundance. With what deep kindliness and wisdom, he leaves tens of millions all over the earth, bowed in heart-aching grief. But as he well knows, the struggle continues. So inspired by his noble example, let us lift our heads slowly but proudly high and march forward in the fight for peace, for a rich and rewarding life for all. In the inspired words of Lewis Allen, our progressive lyricist, to you, beloved comrade, we make this solemn vow. The fight will go on. The fight will still go on. Sleep well, beloved comrade. Our work will just begin. The fight will go on till we win.
Thank you indeed for that extremely moving contribution, which certainly reduced me to tears, for which I make no apologies. Um, and after such a moving contribution, it seems childish to want to say anything. But I do need to say something, because uh, Ranjit was given the remit that he's accomplished so very well. But there is really some area that needs to be talked about. Our meeting was advertised as Joseph Stalin, the architect of Sochi. And I wish to say, with your permission, for a few words on his role as the architect of socialism. We fought for the future, destroyed the invader, and brought to our homeland the laurels of fame. A glory will live in the memory of nations, and all generations will honor her name. Long live our Soviet motherland, built by the people's mighty hand. Long live her people, united and free, strong in a friendship tried by fire. Long may our crimson flag inspire, shining in glory.